we see uh, as we think in terms of the importance of motivating people to read God's word, when he sees from being lazy or idle and give no chance for the devil to tempt us. And, and like we said just a moment ago, that an idle mind is the devil's workshop, you know, and several other things that were said along those lines. And, and how many times people get in trouble because they just don't have anything to do. And so they find something, or if you want to put it this way, the devil says, hey, why don't you try this? <laughs> why don't you do that? Or some friend comes by as the devil's emissary, and next thing you know, you're involved in something that you shouldn't be, but because you had time on your hands, and instead of reading the Bible, of course, you know, you always want to find something else. But we need to motivate ourselves to become better readers. And folks, again, uh, there's been times that I have taken courses in speed reading, and uh, pretty amazing sometimes how fast we can read, how fast we can capture lines. Uh, but there's something also about just kind of savoring it. Uh, I'll be quite honest with you. There's a time I had to, I had to eat in a hurry. And sometimes I had to eat on the run. And usually those times I don't really enjoy it as much. I love when I can sit down and chop that steak up real good, you know, and just chow down on it, mix it in some mashed potatoes that have butter just keeping all over them, a little bit, touch of salt and pepper, a couple of other things, you know, and uh, maybe put a little extra sauce on that one particular bite or whatever. I enjoy sitting down that way instead <laughs> I remember one of the funniest scenes I remember in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we were uh, visiting, you all might remember the red-headed lady, young lady that came here and, and uh, was with our kids. Anyhow, I was with her father. Her father of all things married a movie star. And the movie star he married, she was actually had a child out of wedlock and several other things. But she was, uh, the equivalent of Little House on the Prairie, and it was called Seven Alone. And it's an Australian uh, type, like I said, prairie, uh, House on the Prairie type thing. And she was the little girl in that. So anyhow, uh, they, had, they had, I think, seven children. And, uh, but anyhow, we went out visiting. Of course, their car, the steer wheels on the wrong side, and they drive on the wrong side of the road. Of course, they said we do, but anyhow, we know we're right and they're wrong. But all that said, <laughs> We went out, and he had this particular leg. Every, every every meal, he would eat salmon. I mean, salmon. But he would eat things in between. And so one day, we're, we're, we're driving down the road. And as we're driving down the road, and he was a good-sized guy, probably about six foot six, something like that. He had this big bowl. And of all things, he was eating cereal while we're driving down the road. <laughs> and... Uh, Anyhow, it was uh, pretty entertaining, and he didn't think anything about it. And then the next time, he was eating a tall style while we're driving down the road, you know, uh, with the big old bowl, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it was kind of wild. He was very, different, very intelligent man. I've got some of his books in here. He definitely loves the Lord. Had a tremendous uh, ministry with Muslims, and was put in a rich and just uh, a number of Muslims, and it was exciting because I got to meet them and got to uh, work with them with some design and stuff. And uh, it was exciting because they were so, uh, well, for lack of a better word, they were so excited and challenged about Jesus and what Jesus, the fact that he loved them in spite of their backgrounds. And so it was very uh, exciting. The last meeting I was with, we had 25 uh, and it was funny because when I spoke, then they had to translate in what like the laws of anyhow, they had to translate in their language. And uh, so it was kind of uh, interesting to say the least, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was really neat. But the people were just eating up the word. They were just reading all these things. And of course, he had some special notes for them and they, they would translate for the ones that didn't understand English. By the way, in Australia, if you don't learn English within the first year that you're there, they send you back home. You can't stay in the country. So you have to be able to speak enough English to get around before you're accepted into their country and can become a citizen or even apply for citizenship. And uh, that's how they take care of their immigration problem, okay? So again, uh, need to mold them to uh, uh, motivate people to become a better reader. And then understand that 
one truth from the Bible is worth more than all the wisdom of man. And so many times we, we get that all backwards. We go, well, this guy's really smart. You know, he really knows nothing, whatever. And, and we get off on him and we just go, wow, that he's something. And yet what we need to realize is we look at God's word. God's word is really something that we all need to apply it to our lives. First Timothy chapter four, verse 13, not a real long verse, but it has a lot in it. It says simply this, till I come, give attendance to read. And so many times that, that, that's part of our message, that's part of our preaching, that's part of our ministry is reading God's word to you. But he says, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And doctrine referring to teaching. So God says it's important that we teach you. It's important that we exhort and, and please encourage you to live a godly life. And then it's important that we always read God's word. That that be part of our, our worship, but that be part of our daily life, that we spend time reading God's word. And so in the, the way we're introduced to it, both the body and the brain have a tendency to be lazy. And uh, let's face it, it's just, it's just easier sometimes. Uh, work can get kind of, become work. <laughs> and uh, modern technology allows and encourages us to put our brains in neutral and let the television and the internet and video games or cell phones do the thinking for us. But people boast of being broad-minded, but are too busy to think about what it is right or what is wrong. They just don't want to, it hurts the mind to think about those things. So in Paul's second letter to Timothy, we get some insight into this aged apostle. He's, uh, when I say aged, yes, uh, chronologically, he's, he's got some years under his belt. But because of the torture and persecution and other things that he'd gone through, uh, the privations and so forth, uh, he's aged a lot more than other people probably would have aged. And so as we look at him and close his life, he isn't sitting in a lazy boy recliner, enjoying his social security check, uh, or planning this next trip that he can make uh, to Maui. He's, he's not doing any of that stuff. And, but we see that he has a frail, aching body. He's hunched in the corner of a cold, damp Roman prison awaiting execution. I've been in that prison. I uh, thank the Lord I wasn't an inmate there, but it was such a name, and black bed, but uh, description. It was very stinky. Uh, apparently, a portion of the sewage system of Rome still kind of runs to the bottom part of this. You come up to it, and it's a hole in the ground. Literally, I mean, it's a, this gigantic hole, and they built, you know, uh, like a building over it. And of course, this building was built back, you know, over 2,000 years ago. And so, as you look in there, basically what they had to do is they had ledges down there. And so, a prisoner, they would take them and they would lower them on a roll. As they would lower them on that roll, they would swing. Them. And so finally they could swing them to the other side of, of that where there was a, a shelf like type thing, and that's where they were living. And that's what they would do with the food and other things. They'd swing it over to the side for they get what they needed. And so uh, they would say that you didn't get a lot of visitors, and, uh, you know, but anyhow, it was something else to say the least. But there he is in this dark place and a cold, miserable, stinky, uh, just we can go on and on. No doubt the probably the biggest rats in the world were probably down there. And uh, no doubt the devil bats and other things too that were constantly about him. But he was waiting there for his execution. And of all things, he's waiting for him to chop his head off. And so of course he looked at it this way, he was going to get ahead because he'd be going straight to heaven. And so that didn't even bother him. He expects at any moment to hear the footsteps of the executioner who will lead him to the chopping block before Nero's throne. And so as he is ready to be offered up, he's ready to die for the cause of Christ, 
and, uh, and he's given himself over to taking care of Timothy, to encourage Timothy, to look at him as a son and a born in the ministry. Timothy uh, will enable him to carry the baton faithfully for him. Uh, he'll pick up the slack for Paul when he leaves, when he's gone. But as he shivers in the shadows of that lonely cell, he writes, the cloak that I left at Troy is with Carpus. When thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Second Timothy chapter four, verse 13. And I, I want to emphasize several other things, but you realize they didn't have electricity, okay? Uh, the only electricity they had that was the, you know, like both nights, you know, from the, uh, from the storm or whatever. And uh, maybe they got some static electricity from this or that or whatever. But for him to read, somebody would have to donate a candle to him. Plus, he'd have to find some way to light that candle. And we could just go on and on all the hearts. In other words, it would have been a lot easier for him just to lay in a corner. Maybe he could have just said something, well, it's just too hard to read. It's too hard to study God's word. God understands. God knows he's the one to put it in here. I'll, I'll just pray over here in this corner. And no doubt he did pray. There's no question about that. Uh, that he was praying for the early church. He was praying for others that they might come to know Christ as their Savior. He was praying for the Roman Empire that, that uh, those in leadership might get saved and also the uh, population would. But we find that he says, and, and here's another one. You ready? He had eye problems. And uh, last night, my eyes were really acting up. It was a real pain just trying to read the scriptures. And my wife says, because I was out in the sun too long without the shades on, whatever. But uh, it was hard to read. And so anyhow, but he said, uh, of all things he could say, bring the cold. So I showed that he was physically very cold in that dark, cold, damp place. But also, he said, bring the books. More than anything else in his sight, bring the parchments. That's the scriptures. Bring those with you. And so again, uh, why would he need that material? Is he getting ready to preach a big revival meeting? Well, they're fixing to uh, execute him. So why would he need all that material? <laughs> why would he need to read those things? Because he's not going to be able to use it. He's not going to be able to teach anybody else. Why? Because he loved God's word. He loved God. And he wanted to know all he could about it. So in his dying moments, his desires, that physical, mental, and spiritual, all stayed right. He said, my body is cold, so bring me my coat. My mind is weary, so bring me my books. My soul is hungry, so bring me the scriptures. I have a few more hours to use for Christ. This is no time to be complacent. What a testimony. Nothing conceals your laurels so much as you resting on them, okay? So Paul was practicing what he had preached here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, it, as you look here, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he presents his desire to learn more about Jesus. So all that said, we want to ask the Lord to bless him for our message today. And uh, George, would you mind praying for us? Father, we come to you this morning in prayer, and Lord, we thank you that we're able to be in your house this morning. God, I pray that you would help us to attend our mind to the truths that we've been taught to us this morning. God, we pray that each and every one of you receive a special blessing this morning. God, we ask all of us in your name. Amen. Thank you, George. And so, first of all, I want to share with you is the challenge of a searching mind. And I hope that you never reach a place, like I said, that's the thing I appreciate about this lady with the partial name of Virginia, uh, 96 years old, and the fact that she was still trying to learn more about the Lord, uh, not to secure her salvation, because she was already very certain of that, that she had trusted Christ. 
but that we need to be searching because there's always something more we learn. I, I appreciate Brother uh, John this morning. He took our water cooler out because it was broken and he took it home and he opened it up and found out that the, uh, the lines uh, that lead it to the, the cooler part and everything else were all busted up, all the pieces. And uh, so I thought, well, that's that. And then uh, he said this morning, he he saw it still sitting out there. Uh, it's you know the old our old water cooler still sitting out there on the road. Hoping somebody to pick it up. And he looked out and saw it still there. And he said, you know what? What's wrong with me? He said, we can still run the water through there. He said, it just won't go through the freezer part. It won't go through the you know through the freon or whatever. And uh, it just be cold water coming directly from you know, from the water source. And I said, yeah, that's great. So he said, I, I guess I had an epiphany. <laughs> and usually uh, we think of epiphany coming from studying God's word. But uh, when he woke up this morning, he said, that's what happened. So God revealed to him, yeah, we can still look at the water cooler. And it probably costs us a lot less electricity because the water cooler will cool the water even if nobody's drinking it, it will cool it. And so now we'll just have it directly coming in uh, to our building, and uh, that would be great. But all that said, the challenge of a searching mind. Folks, we can't afford to just stop. In fact, what happens in a nursing home is many times people just stop using their brain, and it's not long that they become what we refer to as a little season hour. Well, they're just not quite right. And that's because our brain is designed to be used. And in this space, there's things that we can get involved in that are gonna hurt our brain. Uh, they're gonna cause us to uh, pull away from God. They're gonna uh, cause other problems. But then there's things that we can do that can help our brain so we can get in a closer relationship with the one that designed our brain and so that he can help us so we can continue to be fruitful well into uh, our, our age or, or whatever, but give attendance to read it. So he simply said this in 1 Timothy 4, 13, till I come, give attendance to read. So he emphasized how important it is to read God's word. God's word is such a, an important book. And uh, as we uh, read it, it, it's something that can help us that we can grow. And uh, just as uh, John used that, that, that term, he said, I had an epiphany this morning. In other words, it's like he'd been thinking on something, and then suddenly he saw something that he didn't see before. And that's what happens with God's Word. Statistics that show that the Americans spend more money annually on chewing gum than on books. Okay, <laughs> what's happened? But while reading is important, what you read is far more important. So again, we need to read and talk the minds. The information highway is cluttered with garbage and debris that is deterring many a life from God's destination for them. And so it's important for us to make sure that we're on the right trail. And the only way we can be on the right trail is by having the right map. And God's word, we should look at it as a map. Uh, I, I know for years, uh, one of the uh, sections of scriptures that I used, it was referred to as the Roman road map to heaven. And so we use the book of Romans to show people how to go to heaven. And it's referred to as a map. And I remember seeing one particular uh, track that was uh, handed out and it actually had a picture of an old fashioned looking map and so forth. And uh, uh, referring to the fact that we have a map showing us how to get to heaven. But we have a map that helps us so we can help direct others to heaven also as we look at the Word of God. So I'm amazed at how enamored we are with the wisdom of men and how bored we are with God, with God's truth. We're all ears to take the ruse of the ESPN or Fox News. But when our pastor stands to read the scriptures, our minds wonder. And our attitude is, we've well, heard all this before. <laughs> but the scripture says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? 
where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. So no wonder this world is in such a mess. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt not be a priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. So uh, all these are, it's so important for us to realize that God's word, we need to let it help us to map out uh, what we need to do for God. The following was found written in the blind leaf of the evangelist Billy Sunday, and uh, in his Bible after he died, and uh, Lord will appear June, uh, June the 21st, our church with Liberty Baptist here in town. Uh, we'll be having a revival meeting in part of the buildings that belong to Billy Sunday that uh, were there for his preaching. It was his headquarters uh, in the United States. It was over there in Warsaw. And so we look forward to that. Uh, they had sort of a reenactment uh, of a cottage close by where there's a woman that tells you about him. And I don't know if any of ever gone through that before, but she wears the garb of that particular uh, time there and so forth. And she just shared, she said, well, the doctor went ahead and he did this, he did that today. Uh, by the way, last week when he was preaching and that she had given the day or whatever, uh, there was a total of 3,200 that accepted, you know, and, and she just shares these things with me. So it's really pretty interesting. And so uh, all that is going to be open for us uh, so we can go in and, uh, and it's the actual cottage where he lived. And so again, a very, very godly man. So anyhow, I'm sharing that with you right now because this was found in his Bible. And here's what he said. And, and I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, he was a uh, professional ball player when he got saved. He was actually not an all of two, but he was a professional ball player when he trusted Christ to save him. So this is the way he explains his salvation and his experience with the Bible. He says, 29 years ago, with the Holy Spirit as my guide, I entered at the portico of Genesis and walked down the corridor of the Old Testament art galleries, which with, were pictures of Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Isaac, Jacob, and Daniel hung on the walls. I passed into the music room and the Psalms where the Spirit sweeps the keyboard of nature until it seems that every reed and pipe in God's great organ responds to the heart of David, the sweet singer of Israel. I entered the chamber of Ecclesiastes, where the voice of the preacher is heard, and into the conservatory of Sheridan and the lily of the valley, where sweet spices filled and perfumed my life. I entered the business office of Proverbs and on into the observatory of the prophets where I saw telescopes of various sizes pointing to far off events, concentrating on the bright morning star, which was to rise above the moonlit hills of Judea for our salvation and redemption. I entered the audience room of the King of Kings, catching a vision written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thence into the correspondence room with Paul, Peter, James, and John, writing the epistles. I stepped into the throne room of Revelation with tire of the glittering peaks, where sits the King of Kings upon his throne of glory, with the healing of the nations in his hand. And I cried out, All hell the power of Jesus' name, that angels prostrate and fall, bring forth the royal diamond and crown him. Lord of all. And this is found uh, and shared by Dr. W. A. Criswell, the pastor of First Baptist Church there in Dallas. And he had this information that was shared uh, that he had found uh, in his book, in his Bible, please. So I wonder, does that describe your Bible reading? <laughs> you know, do you look at it and go, wow, 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 as you look into God's Word? Or, or did you just check off the box on a Bible reading schedule and went, yeah, I read another one, you know. And uh, oh, I mean, I caught up on my reading or I'm ahead on my reading and, you know, whatever. And uh, again, how sad it is. Many times uh, we try to read the Bible like it's any other book 
are we reading like the site taking medicine that we really don't want to take, but we'll go ahead and take or we'll take those vitamins even though now whatever. But we just do it because we know we need to, we're supposed to. And you know, somebody says, Do you ever read your Bible? Yeah, I read the Bible. Yeah. But do you really read it? And when I look at how Billy Sunday read it, I think he see he really read it. And he read it with such excitement and anticipation as he got into God's word. So give adherence to ruminating. And ruminating, I, I don't know if you've ever had it. Uh, any of you ever had rabbits before? Okay, some of you have, so you know what we're talking about. I remember the first time we went to eat one of our rabbits. <laughs> uh, uh, my mom got sick, and because so she, because she could see that that buddy rabbit before we skinned it, gutted it, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, anyhow, she didn't eat it, even though she cooked it and everything else. Because she picked that little rabbit in the corner, you know, eating its food and then eating it again and so forth. But anyhow, uh, they, they're one of those animals that do it. Of course, a cow. Uh, how many stomachs does a cow have? That's it all. Okay. You say four or five. Anyhow, they've got a bunch of stomachs, right? Okay. I mean, and a four? Four stomachs that they have and they eat. They regurgitate a little bit, and they chew a little more, and so forth. But each time they get something else out of it, and it's kind of interesting. But God, when He uses the word meditation, that's what it's referring to. It's just reading God's word, but not just saying, "Well, I read it, I got it done." But it's that, man, I read it. I wonder what the Lord meant by it. Wow, do you do that? You know, or I remember I was reading some other scriptures that. And I, I never thought, but they tied the little scriptures that, you know, and suddenly things begin to grow and it gets exciting as we study God's word. But as we look at 2 Timothy 2.15, it says this, study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, did you read God's word today or yesterday? And did you read it with God? Uh, this is for you. And I need you to reveal to me what I need to see in this. And, and Lord, I know that you're trying to talk to me. Uh, well, maybe I should rephrase that, that you're talking to me through your word. And sometimes I'm afraid that I just kind of close off my ears and my mind and I just read it and I go, well, I did what I was supposed to do. I read, you know, 15 minutes today or whatever. And we stop. But a workman that needed not to be ashamed. So, rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, as I mentioned Thursday, we were out visiting. And I told you about the nine, six year old lady that we met. But then next door, we met another lady, and uh, her name was Kimberly. And I forgot where my ear aids that day, and I thought she said Timber. Now, uh, oh, that's an unusual name, Timber. Uh, but anyhow, then now uh, it was Kimberly. But anyhow, uh, as we talked to her, uh, she just suddenly started, you know, saying all sorts of things. I said, well, I hope that uh, you'll pray uh, for my children uh, because they're, they won't come here to the States. But the airlines have gone out of business. And so they spent $12,000. And then also she just started rebuking me and tearing me all to pieces. Uh, Jay said he thought I did really well handling uh, the situation. But she was letting me know that she has a better knowledge of the Word of God. And she let me know right from the beginning that I speak in tongues because the Holy Spirit just starts speaking through me. And I said, well, do you know what you're saying? She said, I have no idea what I'm saying, but I know that God is speaking through me. And I'm going, yeah, God's the author of confusion. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but <laughs> the, the Bible says Satan's the author of confusion. But anyhow, but she let me know that what you're talking about, your kids learning uh new languages and stuff like that. that's not what the Bible's talking about that's you know so she corrected me there <laughs> but then she went on and she said that uh, you have no business because God is going to take care of your kids and he's going to take so you have no reason to say pray for God's will to be done in their lives that is stupid and I said well James chapter 4 and I went to James and immediately she said no I, I believe in Proverbs 28, 13. 
and I looked it up, and I don't know what that had to do with anything, but anyhow, <laughs> but it just surprised me how far off she was, but no matter what I said, she had something far superior to say. Okay, and I was thinking, I was watching her husband, and he just kind of shaking his head a little bit, you know, uh, over whatever, and so finally, uh, we got off and some other things, and, uh, but, I was never really get anywhere with her because she knew so much more and had a better understanding of God's word than I had. And and in all language, she told me, she said, you don't know what you've missed if you haven't talked in tongues when you just totally turn yourself over and you just said, well, 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 well. And, and you know that God is speaking through you. And uh, she said, you have really lost out. You Baptist just are dumb. Uh, in Haiti. And she said, your kids learning these languages so people get saved, that, that's, that's not what it's about. That's not what God's word is about. It's just, it just being able to speak in this unknowable tongue is so wonderful. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can ask you, he can give you better details on it probably. If you just have to observe what was going on. But it says that needed not to be ashamed. And whenever I started sharing scriptures supporting uh, what we believe, she immediately said, no, no, no. And she would not have said, no, or she got upset when I said, well, we need to pray for God's will be done. And she immediately said, that is unscriptural. That's not true. And okay, rightly dividing the word of truth. Wow. Right. That verse, she didn't want to hear that verse. That verse did not apply to her. And it, it doesn't apply to anybody, okay? But 2 Timothy 2 15, Jesus said, Search the scriptures for in them you think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. So, folks, we need to read God's word, and it will help equip us for all the things that we will face today and all the things that we'll face tomorrow. When we have a right knowledge of God's word, John chapter 5, verse 39, makes it very clear that when we know God's word, then we can clearly share with others about Jesus. So the gems of scriptures are not always uh, found on the surface. Now, sometimes they are, but they sometimes you have to the mine, you have to get diligent, you have to dig for that treasure. And uh, I mean, you think about how many people say, man, I found this treasure chest in my backyard and it was just sitting right back there. And I had no time how many years it had been sitting there. <laughs> no, you find out that they had to dig down to it uh, and, uh, in order to, to get to the, the goodies. But they must be mined by a diligent search. And this one says here, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and incline thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And that's Proverbs chapter 2, uh, verse 1 through 5. And so it's very, very important that we'd be willing to dig into God's word to learn more about what God has for us. And many times we miss out on so many things because we don't dig out of the service. Uh, we, we just look and it's not there, forget it. And uh, but what a blessing when you're able to dig and you're able to find this, you're able to find that, you go, know, wow, I forgot all about that, or I didn't know that even existed, or you know, we go on and on. But again, the second thought is the challenge of a stirred mind. And again, we need to stir our mind. There's just something about a, a good workout. I, uh, on Wednesday, went to the orthopedic surgeon and concerning the surgery of my knee. And he said, let me just be quite frank with you. He said, if any other doctor saw your MRI, and saw your x-rays, and saw the other work that we had done up on your leg, the first thing they would say is, we've got to do surgery, we've got to do it now. He said, you have all this scar tissue, 
He said, you have all this arthritis, you have all this calcification, you have a ganglion cyst, and he just went on and on. He says, you have all these things. But he said, go ahead right now, lift your leg, and I want you to just raise it as, as far as you can. And he said, okay, and now I want you to bend it back as far as you can. And so I did all these things, and he said, it's unbelievable what you're able to do. And he said, it's, and that's not by accident, but it's because of the fact that you do run every day. It's because you, you stretch it and you do all these things. And he said, here's the problem. If we do surgery on you right now, he said, we can't get you to where you are right now. And the surgery, because you'd have to wait so long, things would happen and, and your leg would stiffen up, your knee would stiffen up, and we would lose all this movement that you have here. You would lose a portion of that. So when we do surgery, my goal is to get you so, like if, if you're here, I can get you here to here, you know? But instead he said, if, if you're already here and here, I'm gonna only be able to do this and this with the surgery. So uh, again, you go to another doctor and the first thing they'll say, well, because of this and because of that and because of that, we gotta do the knee surgery. But we're not, uh, you know, but they would. And so he said, you go to another surgeon and they would immediately, when they look at all this, they would say, yes, you need surgery. But he said, the purpose is, we want you to be able to move more freely. And so as we look here in God's word, God wants us to learn his word so that we can have a greater knowledge of him instead of limiting ourselves and so as a result, we have to dig and we have to work. And, and here's the thing, he said, if you had not been working out all these years and doing this, uh, yeah, we, we would have had a surgery, no question about it. But because you have, we have that option. And if we do it, and again, my recommendation is that we don't do it. So what am I saying all that for? That folks, we need to study God's word. And we can say, yeah, I know God's word. Yeah, I, I know those scriptures. But do you really know how much have you dug into God's word to help you to have a better knowledge, to help you to be the spiritual person that you need to be? Let's face it. The biggest problem in our country is the fact that we have all these unspiritual people that are running it. <laughs> we, we have unspiritual people uh, that are in our churches and we could go on and on. But what we need is people that are willing to work and get into God's word, let God's word get into them so that they can be effective for the cause of Christ. So again, we need to be willing to search. And what was I saying? Well, the point was we need the, cha the challenge of a stirred mind. So we need to work on our mind. We need to memorize, we, we need to, Regurgitate, uh, well, I mean, uh, 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 the, the meditation. We need to meditate on God's word and uh, so that we can have a better knowledge of his word. So the stirring of an exhortation. Notice 1 Timothy 4, 13 again. Till I come, give attendance to exhortation. So God says, you ready? We need to encourage each other. We need to challenge each other. We need to be faithful in, in hearing the preaching and preaching and teaching of God's word. It's designed to help stir our mind to think upon the things of God. Again, the apostle Peter wrote his second epistle for this very purpose. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So Peter said, I want you to thank all these things and I want to stir up your memory because so many times we forget things. But Peter's audience had heard the truth many times before, but it was his desire to keep preaching it so that their minds would be established in the truth. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, referring to his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And folks, it's so need to remember what God has done for us. 
how God has worked in our life in the past and how God's word has helped us and enlighten us, if you please, as we go along life's way. The seduction of elapsing. And today people think that they have killed the fatted cat if they go to church on Sunday morning. And the book of Acts, the people went every day to church. And you go, how in the world could they afford to do that? And it's funny because I think they look at us today and go, how in the world can you afford not to go to church more? How can y'all do that? <laughs> and they would look at us just the totally the, the opposite. Maybe that's why the early church was seeing constant revival. And we are not, okay? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, 25, we know that Jesus is coming soon. Jeremiah said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me in the fountain of living waters and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah 2, 13. And again, folks, we have to work to keep things in our memory. We have to work to, to know God's word. Uh, it's not saying, well, I read God's word uh, you know, last week, so I'm okay. <laughs> uh, we need to work on it. The parking lots and stadiums and movie houses and bars and shopping centers are packed daily as we fill our lives with all, the, all that the wealth of the world has to offer. While there are pews at the front of the church that have not been set on in years, no wonder our minds resemble cesspools rather than fountains of truth. So if you say, I, I don't like preaching, it makes me uncomfortable. It's supposed to, okay? And how many people say, man, I just really enjoy running that four miles a day and just pushing and pushing and pushing and boy, my guts were hurting. I had a stitch that just went on and on and on. And boy, it wasn't long and the blisters I could feel them building up in my feet. Oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> and, uh, it takes a little bit of work to, to get in shape. So it's supposed to. God's word comforts the stress but also distresses the comfortable. You got that? So take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God that exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. So in a world that is daily numbs our minds, into believing a lie. We need the exhortation of God's word to stir us up to truth. And again, it is so important that we let God's word stir our minds. The third thought, the challenge of the un, of a sound mind. And the folks, I deal with people all the time. I mean, even this week, we had a lady that called. She was broken hearted and she was sick. And she was disturbed because her mother's mind is no longer sound. It's no longer what it used to be. And it was a woman that had grown up in church and had raised her children in church, but her mind has had several things that have happened to it. And it's just sad how uh, an unsound mind and the problems have come from it. So the order of a sound mind, you know, I come and give doctrine, I give attendance to doctrine, First Timothy chapter four again. But exhort Timothy to stir up the gift which is in thee. And then uh, the next verse reminded him, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. <laughs> so God wants to help us to have a sound mind. Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. A mind that searches the scriptures is constantly stirred up through the preaching of those scriptures, and they will have a sound mind. I uh, appreciate my mother and all of us uh, worked so hard to memorize scriptures. And like I said, memorize Psalms 119. It would take her 40 minutes to quote Psalms. Can you imagine that? And uh, I, I, how could she have such a same mind? Especially after having nine kids. Ooh, wow. We could go on and on. 
but the obedience of a sound mind. God wants us to have a sound mind. And the devil's going to do all that he can to offer to all these other things that look like they might satisfy our mind. And he wants to help us to crave minds that are not spiritual, but things uh, that will never fill us, that will never satisfy us as we lean on, on the wickedness. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21. Above the dead of this world, Jesus calls, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because you realize he gets into the yoke next to you. And he's able to carry the load. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, where Jesus said all that. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, verses 3 through 4. So don't let your mind become complacent. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6, if you had the beginning of our message, and in Job chapter 23, verse 12, neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Have you eaten today? Yeah. Bible says, yeah, well, I ate this, I ate that, or whatever. Uh, have you eaten spiritually? It says, well, preacher, you just fed something. Well, good. I'm glad you thought that. Okay. So God bless you and look forward to a wonderful service.